Good evening. And God bless you all. As you take your seats, I want to welcome you all to this Intro to Orthodoxy series. So I have to say, it is not easy for me to introduce something as deep as the Holy Orthodox faith. In fact, the church fathers in different places speak about how perilous it is for one to be a teacher, like, because you're accountable to live out the teaching that you're teaching, right? That's a scary thing. Um, it's, 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 it's often that orthodoxy has been called by people who like spirituality, the deep end of the Christian swimming pool, because there's a lot of space down there and there's a lot of things to explore. And uh, as someone who came to the orthodox faith as a young adult, I felt like I was kind of in, in, the, in, the, in the shallow end doing a lot over there. And then I suddenly saw this huge expanse that beckoned to me that, that we might call holy orthodoxy. So our challenge is to try to summarize this faith in 11 talks. What can we expect of our 11 part series that we're currently embarking on? Well, uh, the first three parts are going to be uh, spiritual foundations and orthodox worldview. That's tonight is part of that. Our talk tonight is called Encountering the Mystery. We're kind of framing things in this particular talk and we'll frame more next week and then really get into deep details on the third week. Then part four is a special kind of standalone class on sin, the passions, and asceticism. That's a really one of my favorite classes in the whole series. Uh, part five is Jesus Christ and the tradition that reveals him, which kind of blows the minds of people who may be from a Protestant world where tradition is kind of a bad word. We're going to talk about why tradition is a good word and what we mean by that. So that's coming up, part five. And then in parts six to nine, we're going to unpack the holy tradition of the church from all the different angles. And that, th those are really interesting um, talks. And then we get to parts, the final two parts, 10 and 11, and we'll explore confessing Christ, kind of like how do we live our lives as Christians? How do we apply this? And being conformed to his image as believers uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ in his holy church. So that's kind of the outline of where we're going to be heading over the next uh, 11 weeks. So um, I don't want to talk too much about myself, but I think just to be fair, um, since I'm the teacher of this class, um, it's good that you know a bit about my own journey. I've alluded to a couple things, and it, I think there are moments when my own personal experience can be a helpful kind of uh, part of the story. Um, I was not born into an Orthodox Christian family. I was raised in a Pentecostal home. Um, I was used to camp, camp meetings like that. Uh, this is actually a Methodist camp meeting that I, that I, I visited a while back. Um, and then I went to Catholic high school as a, as, a, as a teenager. So I had like a hardcore evangelical Pentecostal background. And then uh, I went to Catholic high school because it was cheap and good and my parents could afford it. And uh, it was a great experience. I actually had a lot of great encounters. My mom would, would tell me uh, in the middle of high school, I, I was in a church where the Pope was the Antichrist, you know, if you've heard of that before. Um, it was that kind of like Southern style church. And uh, at one point, my mother teared up halfway through Catholic school and said, honey, I think some of those Catholics might actually know Jesus. You know, so that, that, that kind of, that was part of my experience, though, kind of my world be, being a lot broader, uh, my eyes being open to other experiences among Christians. So um, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that because the Catholics introduced me to St. Athanasius and to St. Nicholas and to saints that I now love as an Orthodox uh, Christian. So um, I was not born into an Orthodox family. My first exposure to Orthodoxy seriously was at the University of Florida, a beautiful place in Gainesville a rival of UK Wildcats, uh, and they beat the Wildcats a lot too. Uh, so I, I was there, and I, it was a great experience. Because I, I, I was like, I've got to figure out what kind of Christian I am. And so I, I immediately was visiting churches and trying to figure out what flavor of Pentecostal I was and having some good experiences, some bad experiences. And uh, it, it so happened that my two roommates were was a, a conservative Jew, and that was fun. And then a, a conservative, um, well, an Orthodox Syrian Christian. Um, and we had another roommate who was Presbyterian. So the four of us roomed together and would argue as really good friends. We loved to argue and fight. And um, I thought I was going to convert them to evangelicalism. But in the end, uh, uh, the Orthodox uh, member of our, of our quartet was able to welcome three of us into Holy Orthodoxy. So that was, that's part of my story, actually. So... Um, 
So part of my story too was also encountering faith in college and then also I was a Russian major and so I got to go visit Russia and travel broadly there. And so part of my own, my own experience with orthodoxy outside of America is through the Russian Orthodox prism. So I have a, a deep connection to the Russian Orthodox Church. I've been to Russia now uh, I think six times and each time has been a wonderful encounter with the faith. But tonight, um, tonight I want to speak about experience. Um, I, I shared last week in my short introduction to orthodoxy that there are lots of things about our faith that are cool. You know, we have a 2,000 year history. We have, we have, an, in, we have a very deep um, tradition of worship that's been stable for 2,000 years. We have um, kind of intellectual integrity. We have a deep theological tradition in orthodoxy, the Holy Fathers we were talking about earlier. We have this like, ascetical tradition, this discipline that's part of our faith. Um, there's also a deep sense of God's grace and it preached in the, in the Orthodox Church that I find very moving and important. All these things are true. But the thing that keeps me here, ultimately, is that I know I need to experience God. And I believe that despite my sins, which are many, and despite my own shortcomings as a human being and as a priest, I still am experiencing the grace of God, experiencing God directly in my life. And it's that experience that has, if you will, made me remain Orthodox and has, has grounded me as an Orthodox Christian. And so that's kind of where this next step of tonight's talk will begin with the idea of experience. So there's a wonderful book by Patrick Bartholomew of Constantinople. And it's worth noting that, especially in this particular moment, uh, there's a, a bit of tension between Patrick Bartholomew and the Patriarch of Moscow. And I will not go into all of that, but I will only say this, I have deep love for both of these patriarchs, and I'm confident things will work out in the end between them. And our OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, has been very um, bold in trying to maintain warm relations with both churches, both our mother church, the Russian church, as our, as our mother church, but also the, the first among equals, which is Patriarch Bartholomew. And so we, we intentionally try to serve and celebrate with both of these uh, bishops and maintain warm ties. But Patriarch Bartholomew's book, the, uh, this book is a, a wonderful introduction to the Holy Orthodox faith. And I'm going to draw some themes out of this book tonight. And even the title of my talk tonight is Encountering the Mystery, Experiencing the Mystery. In his book, the Patriarch quotes St. Nikolai of Zicha, who said this, Our religion is founded on spiritual experience, seen and heard as surely as any physical fact of this world. Not theory, not philosophy, not human emotions, but experience. This is a foundational point for the Orthodox Christian. We're not just looking for theology or knowledge or book stuff. We're looking to experience the living God. While the very word orthodoxy might seem to signify like a dogmatic or liturgical rigidity, what, it literally, what, what does it literally mean? Right worship. right worship. Ortho, like orthodontic, straightening out. Right doxa. Doxology, right doxology, right glorification, right praise. It means all those things. And the fathers of our faith would remind us again and again that orthodoxy insists upon the equal importance of creed and experience. Creed and worship. These things always go together. You can't separate them. You, and we would say you can't have ritually pure orthodoxy without doctrinal solidity. And you can't have doctrinal solidity without orthodoxy in terms of ritual and prayer and, and the life of, of liturgical worship. All of this belongs together. And so this is a major principle that we find again and again in the ancient fathers up through the present time, like in 20th century writings, um, just within our own generation. Patriarch Bartholomew says this, Orthodox Christianity is a way of life in which there is a profound and direct relationship between dogma and praxis, faith and life. The unity of faith and life means that the reality of the eternal truth lies in their experiential power rather than in their codification into a set of ideological constructs. Isn't that powerful? I'm going to say that again. The unity of faith and life means that the reality of the eternal truth lies in their experiential power rather than in their codification into a set of ideological constructs. 
So in short, well, this is not a, a seminary class, right? We are hoping that whatever we're discussing here will then be a catalyst for us to experience God in our own lives. So he would, Patriarch Bartholomew says this, truth is beheld, it's not merely understood intellectually. God is seen, not examined theoretically. Beauty is perceived, not speculated about abstractly. And this is a, a critical difference, I think, in some of the ways that our, our dear friends in the Roman Catholic Church might approach theology. They have a real, a real robust intellectual tradition. That isn't all bad. But we would say, calm down, guys. There, there's other ways, there are other reasons for us not to go whole hog into the kind of theological abstraction of certain traditions. So, think about this. When we are in love with somebody, we have a, a girlfriend or we have a boyfriend, and we want, we're thinking about, do we want to live a life with this person? There are many ways that we might seek to understand that person. Um, one could theoretically... Uh, dissect that person, cut that person apart. But a much better approach, a much better approach is to spend time with that person, have a cup of coffee, you know, go on a date, talk to their parents, experience that person in his or her daily life, right? And I think our critique of a lot of theology is that it, 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 it sometimes does the dissection thing rather than actually experience the person, experience the other. And so we want to make sure that as we're learning about the Orthodox faith and learning about Christianity uh, more broadly, uh, we are not just deconstructing or dissecting it, we are loving it. And we are, we're letting that, 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 that relationship with God and with, with the tradition of the church, which we believe is the Holy Spirit at work in us, all of that forming us, all of that softening our hearts uh, unto the Lord. So, this is a good point for questions. We can do more questions later. I'm on a roll, huh? Okay, a single, a single theme, Patriarch Bartholomew suggests, binds everything together in the Orthodox Church. He says this, each human person is uniquely created in the image of God, never able to be reduced to anything less than a mystery. A person is a mystery. For us, God reveals himself to us, and we experience him. But part of that beauty of him is that he reveals himself not just as an abstract mystery, but as a person, as a deep person. He doesn't give us only rules or laws to follow. Yeah, he does give us commandments, and they're not unimportant. But the Christians celebrate that he reveals himself as a person in the depths of human personality. So personhood for us Orthodox is key. And, and, and note, by the way, we don't like the word individuals very much. You don't find that in the fathers. You don't find that really used anywhere. It's only used in liturgy one time, but it, it doesn't mean individual person. It means the particular needs of a person, which is different. Uh, but it's never a person. It's, uh, individual is never used as the word for person. We speak about persons in communion, persons who are loved by God, persons who love God, who love each other. So we are, we are persons who are called to experience authentic personhood, to become truly human through the God who became man and dwelt with us and is made known to us not, not only as a force or power, though he, he has power and he has force, but the one who comes to us, who's revealed himself to us. We don't, we don't philosophize our way to Jesus. He reveals himself to us as a living person, as a human being. And so, for the rest of our reflection today, we're going to touch on four major themes that support an orthodox understanding of real personhood. So, person as mystery. These, this is a theme, person as mystery. The first thing we want to look at is this theme here. And St. Macarius the Great, one of our desert fathers from Egypt, famously said, and this is so powerful, within the heart there are unfathomable deep depths there are reception rooms. There are bed chambers within it. There are doors and porches and offices and passages. In the heart is the workshop of righteousness. In it is the workshop of wickedness. In it is death. In it is life. The heart itself, he continues, is a small vessel. Yet dragons lurk there and lions there are poisonous beasts and all treasures of evil. There are rough and uneven roads. There are precipices, 
But there too in the heart, we find God and the angels. Life is there and the kingdom. And there too in the heart is light. There are the apostles and the heavenly cities and the treasures of grace. All things, he says, lie in the space of the human heart. So, why is each person a mystery? Why is the human heart so capacious? Why? Well, the church would affirm that it is because we're each formed in the image of God. An image, if it's a real likeness, as St. Gregory of Nyssa will say, needs to faithfully copy the features of the original image. Since God is the pattern for us, is beyond our ability to perceive and comprehend, so that in a different way, but real way, each person is beyond our ability to perceive and comprehend. So what he's saying is, so God is a mystery. He's a depth. Human beings, because we're, made, we're deep too. We're made in that image. We have a hard time. You've heard the phrase, you know, know thyself. We have a hard time knowing ourselves. There's a lot to know, a lot of horrible things, a lot of good things, a lot of terrifying things. The human heart is a depth, and it's a depth because we're made in the image and likeness of God. And that's why we drive each other crazy sometimes, because there's so much in each of us that can either raise the next person up to the heights of heaven or bring them down to hell. And in all of us, we have this capacity. Um, my, I, I share this in a sermon probably twice or thrice a year. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, said this, if there were only evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds out there, if only we had them, the bad guys, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, if only we could do that, he says. But the dividing line between good and evil, he says, cuts through the heart of every single human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? What a powerful idea, right? That, that we don't just go looking for the evil out there, uh, but rather in, in our own spiritual tradition, we ask God to show the evil in us. It's interesting in the Gospels that are selected by the fathers to be read on Sundays during the year, probably one out of eight has the theme of blindness in it. Because uh, we're, are, we're not saying that everyone else out there is blind, though they are. We're saying, I am blind. I'm the blind man that can't see. I'm the, one that, I'm the one that's lame. I'm the one that can't perceive reality properly. The evil that I have to exercise is not the culture, though it is evil. <laughs> but I have to exercise the demons right here in my own heart. This is where the battle is. This is that dragon thing, right? In the heart of man lurks all this stuff. It's capacious. And that's where the battle is going to rage. So person, another theme, person as truly free. The theme, the, the, the theme of freedom and the human person. Patriot Bartholomew says, the notion of freedom is critical in the orthodox faith and life. Um, he gives a talk, uh, he speaks about a rabbi he met, the patriarchs. He talks about a rabbi he knew who asked a question, what is the worst thing that evil can urge us to achieve? It's a question. And the answer the rabbi offered, to make us forget that we're each the child of a king, to forget that we each have a royal lineage spiritually, to forget that each of us is born to be free. Freedom is a huge part of our belief about the human person. Without spiritual freedom, orthodoxy teaches Authentic personhood cannot be fully realized. So Patriot Bartholomew says this, uh, The human being, as an existential reality, can be a person only when living in freedom, only in conditions in which the dull range of possibilities is open to our free and conscious choice. Are we able to transform, with God's help, our temporal reality and ourselves into the image of the divine kingdom? So, freedom does not mean doing whatever I want, though. <laughs> that would be what our culture says. And we'll, we'll discover as we go that Christian freedom is something very different. St. Justin Popovich of Serbia says this, In truth, there is only one freedom, the holy freedom of Christ, whereby he freed us from sin, from evil, and from the devil. His freedom binds us to God. 
All other freedoms are illusory, false, that is to say, they're all in fact a kind of slavery. This would be a critical insight into freedom. We want to be free, that we might be free. And we have to choose to be free. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, the psalmist says, than to live my life outside. Right? And so this is our idea. Our freedom is to choose freely the one living God. So real freedom requires a lot of work. Developing freedom is an unceasing task, a gift that is acquired through much spiritual effort, our fathers would say. It requires dynamic ascetical discipline. Indeed, the main purpose of our entire ascetical framework in orthodoxy is to assist us in recovering the freedom we have lost. This is why we fast and pray and do have these kind of rules. It's not that the rules save us. Oh, no, the rules don't save us. But the, some of these practices train us to be able to see once again God, to be able to hear the voice of God, to be able to see our own brokenness and know that we must be ready for Him. We're, we're tilling the ground of our heart and our body to receive the gifts from the Lord that He wishes to give us, that He's waiting to give us if we are but ready to receive from, from Him. So to be free is not simply to do what we please, for the only veritable freedom is, the, is to do the will of God. Real freedom is obedience to the Lord. This is what all the fathers teach is the whole witness of our church. And, and of course, the ascetical disciplines are part of this. Prayer and fasting and almsgiving to the poor and supporting the church and worthy causes where we give sacrificially. Pilgrimages to various places, whether it's local at the monastery in West Virginia or it's going abroad, going to Russia, going to Greece, going to the Holy Land. Whatever it is, helping other people in those journeys. We choose these things freely because they enhance our freedom and they help us fight against the dullness of our senses and the kind of, the, the kind of darkness of our time. And so one of the privileges, I think, of being Orthodox in America is that I, I feel like we get to really choose to do this, right? We're not doing this because grandma's, you know, from Russia or only because she's from Russia. Maybe she was from Russia or from Greece. But to keep the faith, we're choosing to do this. We're making a decision to follow the Lord every single day. And that's a great privilege and a great joy. Um, it's also kind of perilous, too. So we, if we were to fall away from our faith, unlike someone in Russia, there's not like a safety net of Orthodox friends and family to, to carry you. Uh, you know, we're a small minority in America, and that's part of our challenge here. So in part four... We'll spend a lot of time unpacking the ascetical disciplines, so we'll come back to that in three weeks. So, we've talked about person as mystery, person as truly free, and now the, the, the sort of a third theme is person as relational, or persons in relationship. <clears throat> Freedom is not only personal, but it is interpersonal. Uh, as human beings, we cannot be generally free in isolation repudiating our relationship with our fellow human beings. We can only be genuinely free if we form part of a community of other free persons. Freedom is never solitary. It is always social. This is an important point. Jesus teaches in the Gospels, we only love God inasmuch as we love our brothers and sisters. You might remember the Good Samaritan parable where the righteous ruler, the righteous man asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the whole parable as an answer to that question. And he tells the story, of course, of the Jewish man who's beat up, right? And the priest and the Levite pass him by. And then the Samaritan, who's the bad guy, comes and helps him and saves him, literally, and brings him to the inn and binds his wounds and pays for his care. At the end of it, Jesus says, well, who was the neighbor? And, Je and, and the, the, the man responds, well, the one who helped him. That's the neighbor. And Jesus says, well, go and do the same. You know, this is how you're supposed to be. Um, we're only saved, if you will. We're only truly human when we're relating to other people. As, as we speak about persons in relationship, it's, it's worth noting a, a very important principle in the divine liturgy. Um, I don't know if you know this, but a priest may not serve the liturgy alone. It's forbidden by the holy canons. Of the, and we'll talk about canon law in like five or six weeks. But the canons of the church do not allow the priest to celebrate a liturgy unless there's other people, at least one other human being must be present 
for the, for the celebration of the liturgy, because the liturgy itself is a social uh, is a social experience. We are we are the priest is proclaiming the blessing, and the people are saying Amen. And there's this this circle happening where we're, we're offering up to God, and and the people are amening it, and we're lifting it up to the Lord, and we're communing with Him. Our Lord says, "Where two or three are gathered in My name, there I am in the midst of them." So that's that's part of our of our closely held tradition. Interesting story. This this holy saint, Saint John of Shanghai in San Francisco, he was a Russian saint who served in China and Western Europe and died in San Francisco. He died in the 60s. Very holy man. Um, but he would serve liturgy every day. That was just, unless it was Lent, when you can't do that. But normally he'd get up in the morning very early and would serve liturgy in his chapel. And it was always open door. People could come. Most days there were people there. It was full. Two or three people, ten people, twenty one. But one day, it was, it got, there was word that got out that he had served liturgy by himself with no one else present. And some of the bishops could be not so nice to each other, and one bishop didn't like him. Later on, that bishop became a close devotee of St. John, but early on, he didn't understand him, didn't like his style, because he thought St. John would also... In Russia, a, a bishop was a prince. You were, to be, you, know, you were representing the church in its, all of its stately glory. And uh, St. John didn't quite get that. And he would, he would give away his clothing during the day. He'd see someone that was poorly, poorly clad. He would offer his cassock to them. I don't know what they're going to do with a cassock. But a blanket, I guess. It, you know, he'd wrap them in his cassock and, and come back in rags. Uh, almost every day he would lose his shoes because he'd give his shoes to somebody. And he'd come back barefoot and would do service barefoot, which the, the other bishops thought was a scandal. He was that kind of guy. But anyway, he would, he would serve liturgy occasionally by himself. And word got out to this other bishop. And St. John, the bishop came to him and said, How dare you break the holy canons and serve by yourself? And St. John very sheepishly said, Well, I don't know. Like, it was okay. I, the angels were all there with me. So there's that kind of approach, right? Like, even if we're alone, we're never alone. Because in our cosmology, God is with us. The saints are with us. The angels are with us. And, 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 and we, we're often with each other as well. So that would not be a normal thing, but he's a saint. I'm not. So uh, another, another example of this persons in relationship, persons as relational beings, was this is my dear mentor, Father, Father Paul Lazor from St. Vladimir Seminary. He died, um, died a, a year ago. Um, a wonderful human being uh, from an old Carpathian Russian family in the OCA. And... Uh, one day I was serving with him. He, he was a beautiful liturgist. He loved the liturgy so much. And one day he started crying in the liturgy. And I said, Father, what's wrong? He said, oh, I'm just so happy right now. I said, why are you happy? This is at the end. He said, because as I'm liturgizing, you're here with me. And, and I look behind the altar and there's my mother and my father who've gone on. And my old bishop and my old priest and all my friends who love God. We're all together. And he's like, and I, I'm just so happy right now. That's, that's the orthodox spirit. And that's the kind of thing that is characteristic of the heart and soul of the orthodox Christian faith. And you can't, it's just part of our life. So, um, and, and then we hold the memories of these people dear to us. The saints aren't just something that we, oh, we like them. No, we relate to them still, even after their death. These are persons who touch our hearts. People like Father Paul, who's not canonized, probably never will be. But he, in my mind, is a holy saint. A man who taught me about the love of God and, and exemplified that in his daily life and certainly in the serving of the divine liturgy. So persons are, are relational. And they're relational because God is relational. Right? We're talking about the persons as mystery, echoes God as mystery. Persons as relational echo the, the, the relationship within the Holy Trinity. And I like to, to bring this up because this is a classic example uh, of how God relates to us. Um, we have in this icon the image in the middle who is dressed like our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a literal representation. It's called the hospitality of Abraham. It represents when Abraham was visited by three angels. And he and Sarah were told in the Old Testament that they would have a son and that the son would continue their line, even though they're very aged. It's a story kind of like today's feast of St. John the Baptist's conception. And uh, you remember his wife laughs at this, and he struggles to believe. But in later days, 
the fathers would see in this visit of the angels, the hospitality of Abraham, they would see a prefigurement of the Holy Trinity. And so this icon is one of those expressions of the Trinity. And so we have in the middle a figure looking a lot like Jesus, clad in the same vestment that Jesus would be in, and sort of presiding over the icon. You see off to the, the right of the Jesus figure is uh, an angel that's positioned in a very regal way, a majestic way, presiding from the side the way a bishop presides when, when he's not serving, off to the side. There he is blessing. And then you have this third figure to our Lord's left. And it's the Holy Spirit beckoning, beckoning the gifts, bless the gifts, urging participation in the mystery. And it's all inverted perspective. It's not modern perspective where, no, the perspective is inverted so that you're brought into the icon. And when you see this, I saw this once in Russia, twice in Russia. You're, you're, it's humongous, by the way. It's as tall, it's almost as tall as this, but it's like seven feet tall. And you're, you're there and you're at the table and, and these figures are beckoning you to participate in the very life that's being depicted in the icon. So this is the point, right? We're relational because God is relational. God is love. And you can't have love unless there's, a, there's a, an offer of love and a receiver of love. And that's the very nature of the Godhead. And we're made to participate, to plug right into that. As created beings, of course, we're not gods by essence. We're, we're gods by grace, if you will. We're called to live the divine life. As human beings, as human persons being, being brought into more and more perfection in the Lord. So this is our calling, and this is beautiful. In the wonderful book, Brothers Karamazov, by Fyodor Dostoevsky, a great Russian writer, he has the elders, Osi must say, we are each of us responsible for everyone and everything. We're all tied together. We can't separate ourselves from the fate of our brothers and sisters. Saint Siloan of Manathos, a great 20th century uh, Greek saint, said, actually he's Russian who lived in Greece, sorry. Uh, he said very famously, my brother is my life. And would, whenever someone was slandered, his bro my brother is my life. I, I am tied to him. I'm saved with him. There's a Russian proverb that says, the only thing we can do alone is go to hell. So we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to, we want to surround ourselves with the love of God and His people. And there's, there's, there's hope in that, of being with, with others and with our Lord. So we have persons as relational. Finally, the, the fourth sort of theme here tonight would be persons as restored icons of wholeness. And this gets to the question really of original sin as well. Persons as restored icons. Um, wholeness, healing exists when we have internal integrity, when we have integrity with other people, when we, when we have integrity with God's creation. All this is, of course, by the power and grace of God. In, in the Lenten services, we say a prayer called the, the Prayer of St. Ephraim. And it goes like this. Um, we speak about taking from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. Give rather, Lord, the spirit of chastity, humility, patience and love to thy servant. The word chastity there doesn't really mean like not having sex, though that's, that's, that's a good thing. Chastity is a good thing. But what it really means is, is integrity. It's having integrity. It's being, being knit together without falseness. It's having a wholeness that human beings need if we're to really be true followers of Christ. And so a major component of our vision as Christians would be this idea of wholeness or chastity, celemudria or sophrosini in Greek. Um, and, and the opposite then of this wholeness would be what we find in our culture, which is like total fracturing of human persons, right? People that have their hidden lives and they, they do all the, they, you know, they do this on Sunday and they say this on Monday and they go here on Tuesday and then they're, they're back over here on Friday. And they just live a life, you know, partly online, partly at work, no integration. And it's kind of the modern or postmodern reality for many people. And, and I say this not to judge because I deal with this and you deal with this. We're, we're not pointing fingers, but we're saying this is the reality of our lives. And it's, it's very different from what the goal would be, which is this wholeness. But wholeness, this integration is a major goal of our Orthodox Christian journey as believers in Christ. And so, so this integration exists then internally, 
with other people and even with the cosmos, with creation. And that's why like, the Orthodox Church does care about the environment and creation because we, we follow St. Paul who said, he said, all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is like a real thing, right? We are, we are called to be um, uh, mediators and of God's grace in the world, not just to each other as persons, but even to the creation. This is part of our calling. The human race was set at the center of God's creation, not so as to exercise a selfish domination over nature, but so as to refashion and transfigure the created order, to give it a voice, and to render it back to God in priestly oblation. One of my favorite themes as a priest that I I chose tonight to drop into here because it's so important to me. In Orthodoxy, we celebrate a multiplicity of mediators. And this blows the mind of my Protestant friends. We love mediators we lo- because we affirm a couple things. First, we, we, we affirm there's only one true mediator. And who is that? Jesus Christ is the one true mediator. We also affirm that if you're baptized, what, what are you called to be? A priest. Right? Uh, the, Martin Luther wasn't wrong about the royal priesthood. Uh, every baptized Christian is called to bear a priestly ministry. Christ is the high priest, the one true mediator, but he came to establish a whole priesthood, if you will. Everyone who is baptized into Christ has put on Christ and must share in that ministry with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's really important. Um, and we, we, we forget all too often that the very point of the Christian life is to mediate and participate in his priesthood uh, for all creation, for the whole world. And so we celebrate as well then the mediators of those who've gone on before us, the holy saints, the Virgin Mary, John the Baptist. We sang about him tonight in the service. Uh, all, the, all the holy saints I've referenced here, and even those who are not canonized but who inspire us, we celebrate them as mediators before God and men, connecting us, not barriers to God, but rather to knit us into God, to bring us into union with God, to bring us into relationship with, with God and to other people. This is the whole point of the, the whole Christian system, if you will, is to unite all of us into God. And so we celebrate this, and we, 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 we would even recognize that those saints are worthy of remembrance and, and celebration because, well... Uh, they, they, every time we recall them, we recall Christ. We recall the image of Jesus in each of them uniquely and specially. And that's worth celebrating. So Christian life is all about mediating. And so you'll, you'll hear me talk about this multiplicity of mediators as we go through the rest of our classes. It's priestly. Another feature of lack of wholeness in our time is radical secularism, where people choose to not see the world as a gift and revelation of God, where people abandon their priesthood to reveal God to their fellow men and to creation. They're, they're forsaking what God has called to mediate. They're forsaking their mediation that God has called them to. So, a couple questions here at the very end tonight. This is a priestly image. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the great high priest, and everyone in the church participating in his priestly ministry. By the way, my priesthood is really a, a tertiary priesthood. You have Christ's priesthood, you have the, the, bap, the baptism, the priesthood of the, bap, of the baptized, and then I have a functional priesthood within, the, within that priesthood. And it's one of service and ordering the life of the church. But ontologically, what's essential is Christ and, and those who are baptized into him, bearing that ministry. So how is the dignity of persons revealed in the Orthodox Christian tradition? Well, it's revealed in the Trinity itself, we would say. It's revealed in the person of Jesus Christ who, who comes into the world and relates to a mother and a foster father and relates to a people, the Jews, who relates to the Roman Empire, who relates to these 12 apostles and to, to the many women uh, who were friends of, of theirs and, and to, the, to the, the 70 apostles and all those who heard his preaching. He relates to all of them. God takes on human flesh, and enters the world. And so we see that in the Trinity. We see that in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd and who lays down his life for the sheep. We see the dignity of humanity, the human persons, in the sacraments of the church. Every sacrament. It's so interesting. I never give out communion and say, the body of Christ. Or here's communion. I say, the servant of God, Audrey Sophia, 
receives the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of soul and uh, sin and life everlasting. Amen. There's always this sense that it's personal and real. And so in baptism, in chrismation, in the Eucharist, in confession, we name the people that are coming. And they're, 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 they're brought into union with God through each and every one of these sacramental mysteries. They're brought into the life of Christ. This happens uh, in marriage, in Christian burial. It happens in the blessing of the waters and in the tonsuring of a monk or nun. It happens in ordination. I, I included uh, my own diaconal ordination at the hands of Bishop Dimitri of Blessed Memory. This is from 2004. Um, I was terrified. <laughs> You, you never go through the royal doors until the day you're made a deacon. And they, throw, they, they literally threw me through. And I stumbled onto, like, I fell on him, basically. Uh, that's the ordination date. And then my priestly ordination uh, in 2005. And my buddy's ordination last uh, two weeks ago. Uh, all these are, 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 are very personal ways of God relating to his people, bringing them, g- gifting them with certain things to serve the body of Christ and others in the community of the church. And so we, we find God affirming dignity through the sacraments. He also does it as we pray. Uh, human persons are sustained and confirmed by prayer. Prayer is the sacrament of our daily life. Prayer is making space for God at all times, not merely reading our prayers, that's part of our tradition, we read our prayers, but also by taking the time to simply be with God uh, through things like the Jesus prayer or silence or however it is that we want to pray and can pray, making space for the Lord and encountering Him. And in doing that, He he affirms our dignity as human persons. We meet Him. The one who is infinite condescends to me and dwells with me, and in my life He makes Himself known. What more dignity can we find than this? In all of these sacraments and all this prayer, God shows Himself faithful uh, to us as human persons. Uh, next week, we will be looking at an Orthodox worldview. We'll ask, first of all, how does an Orthodox worldview contrast with a pagan worldview? Because that's where Christianity begins, right? It's re- relating to Judaism and to paganism, and here's Christianity. And then we'll, we'll contrast Orthodox worldview with other Christian worldviews that are perhaps novel and more recent. And we'll, we'll examine that very carefully, and we'll discuss it. I'm Father Justin Patterson. Thank you for watching our Intro to Orthodoxy series. We're really glad you're joining us for this. We invite you to engage with us in person. Come visit our parish. Come see, taste and see that the Lord is good by visiting our community. Also, take advantage of our website, our YouTube channel, and all the contact information that you'll find on the screen. Thank you very much, and may God bless you.